will continue. Uh, okay, we, we looked at you know a few specifications that could be of interest. So now we started with this complex specification, right? I that okay. The robot should visit region R2, then region R3, then region R4, and finally it should return to region R1 and should stay there. Right. So now can we write this specification formally using this language? So again say initially there is a sequencing, right. So it has to go to region R2, from there region R3, from there region R4, this is what we have done and from there it has to go back to region R1 and it has to always be there, right. So that means uh, after visiting R2, R3, R4, it should be in a state like in all steps in the future it is in R, R1, right. So now what say it has visited R4 here, so what constant do we want to impose here? Yeah, right, so in all the states not pi 2 and not pi 3, right. And that we can nicely capture using this until formula, right. So, we say that once we have visited R4, we had to visit a state where always pi 1 becomes true and in all the states in between not pi 2 and not pi 3 should be true, right. Okay. So, now we see that this logic could be quite powerful to capture interesting requirements. And now we are talking about multi robot systems, right. So, there could be specification where we might want to say that okay, I have a set of robots and I would like any robot to perform some task, right. I do not want to figure out exactly which robot, but any robot you know should take up this task and that is the specification that we want to capture. And alternatively, we would also like to might want to say that all robots in my you know robot suit, they should perform some operation, right. Uh, so, we can extend that language, so by using some other symbol. So, we can say that this was the grammar and we have defined this component of this, right. So, I have a specification phi, right. I would now like to say that any robot, so there exists, so this formula is there exist, uh, I do not know. And a robot R that should satisfy this specification. This is a specification. So, I am basically extending that, that you know logical language by this new operators. It is basically quantified over the set of robots, right. So, I can say that okay, there exists a robot that satisfies this specification psi or I would also like to say that for all robot the specification psi should be satisfied, right. Uh, so, this is this extension, this is an extension to the original language, this LTL linear temporal logic that is a classical language that is not what we have designed. So, we are just using it to capture robotic specification that is what we do, but this is some extension that could be useful to deal with multi robot system, right. And if you have finite set of robots, say you have two robots, right, then you can translate that formula to the original linear temporal logic formula because you might say that okay, I have now two specification uh, psi 1 and psi 2. So, this specification I capture for robot 1 R 1 and this specification I capture for robot R 2, right. So, there exist R psi that will then mean that psi 1 or psi 2, right. So, this specification will be satisfied <coughs> if robot R 1 takes up the task, this specification will be satisfied if robot R 2 takes up that task and then the formula that psi that will be equivalent to 
either this formula becomes true or this formula becomes true right. So, this is kind of you know we call it a syntactic sugar it does not you know add any power to the original language, but this makes it easier to capture requirement for multi robot system where this kind of requirement is there some robot should do that or all robots should do that and so on right. Similarly, you can say that if I have for all r psi right how can I capture this using the basic temporal logic linear temporal logic formula. So, I have this psi 1 formula that will be true if the robot 1 takes the task psi 2 will be true if the robot 2 takes up the task and I want to now write this formula for all r psi in the basic temporal logic formula right. So, how can I write psi then? it will be and right because this formula will be true by robot 1 this formula will be made true by robot 2 and I want to make sure that all robots satisfy this specification. So, I have to add them by and operation right yeah. So, this is now you know we are more or less done with this specification and let us have a look at the whole system. So, we assume that there is a server that communicates with the user and gets the task right. So, then we see that there is a server that is accepting the task from the user and those tasks are being given in linear temporal logic right. And now, this is this system that has two components one is that the system state and the second is this runtime system right. So, it is a framework right I mean ideally it should you know have all these components. So, this you can say that is a concept right and uh, so, we have some bare bone implementation of this whole architecture, but of course, to make it commercial we need much more work. Right. So, at this stage you can say that this is more or less a concept right. and I will I will tell you that which component are in good shape right I mean that you can start using right away ok. Uh, ok. So, yes please. Uh -huh. I will answer this question please hold on this I will come back to that right. Uh, answer is that ok it could be heterogeneous. Okay, but why I, I will come to that later. Okay, maybe th this is this is here also I can answer this. So then look at the system state, right? System means what? I have to take care of the workspace where the robot works, and also the capability of the robot, right? And so this whole system will have a configuration database where the information about the robots will be stored, right? So, for example, I have a quadcopter that can fly with maximum velocity of say 5 meter per second and things like that right, but I will formalize it later you know like what I mean by the dynamics of the robot, but this is more or less the information about the robots that is kept hidden from the user, user even does not need to know what robots are there, their capability and so on right, it will just give the specification. We also have the information about the occupancy grid. So, the idea is that the workspace is represented in the form of a grid right. So, you can impose a mesh like structure like for example, here you know you can look this look at this coil shape like things. So, you can assume that ok this is a location then another grid is another location and so on right. So, we would have to ensure that the robot can move from one location to another location right we can solve the low level control problem to make sure that the robot can move from one cell to certain cells right. Of course, it will be defined for defined robots those who are familiar with non holonomic robot you know like it will not be able to move from one cell to all possible cells right there are restrictions dynamic restrictions right. Similarly, for robot arm it might not be able to move to all possible states from a given initial state right. So, those information will be given the here but that capability will be defined based on the representation of the workspace in terms of an occupancy grid 
right? Uh, these things will be clearer more. And then this is the information that is maintained. Now look at this, right? This system allows you to add robots runtime, right? So if you want to add more robots, you can just, you know, go to this configuration database, add the information. And so let's see how, you know, like uh, the computer science people will look at this, you know, control problem or planning problem. So we'll work with a set of motion primitives for each robot, right? And the, what is a motion primitive? A motion primitive is a short, it's not too long, so short kinematically feasible motion, right? So that means the, I'll talk about a, you know, like motion, short motion that the robot, I know that robot will be able to perform. Uh, and I will try to generate a set of such motions for a given robot, <coughs> right? And those set of uh, motions will be the basis of all possible movements. So I will try to design the motion set of motion primitives in such a way so that I can create many interesting motions. I might not be able to, you know, be exhaustive like this continuous movement. For example, I, for simple ground robot, I might say that, okay, I will have motion primitives that can take the robot in four neighboring region, right? Then of course the robot will not be able to allow to move in this way, this way, this way, this way. So I, I am eliminating many movements, right? But as you can imagine that if I have many movements, then the planning problem will be very hard to solve, right? I can say that, okay, I might want to make these primitives richer by adding diagonal, diagonal movements still it will be an approximation, right? So I will be missing some of the motions, but the idea is that I would like to capture the, you know, most representative set uh, of motion primitives that will be useful to solve many planning problems, right? And with these motion primitives, if the planner fails to solve the planning problem, that doesn't mean that the robot doesn't have a path, right? So this technique that I'm going to you know, talk about, it's not complete but it is complete with respect to a set of motion primitives that we deal with, okay? So given a set of motion primitive, if there exists a trajectory that can be generated by <coughs> using this motion primitive, our planner can find that trajectory, okay? So now let us have a look at it, what it is, right? So, you know, like I am talking about one step motion primitive, but but this could be more complicated, right? So I might want to say that, okay, there is a motion primitive that takes the robot four steps forward in the X direction, right? I might also have a motion primitive that takes the robot from here to here, right? So for each such motion primitive, we know that I can solve the underlying control problem, right? But underlying control problem, if I want to solve, then I would require some precondition to hold. So each motion primitive is active for a duration tau, right? This is the step I'm talking about. So when I, I, I talked about step, right? So this duration of this step is tau. That is coming from the duration of this motion primitive, right? So from here to here, the robot, you know, executes the motion primitive for tau duration of time and it moves here, right? So each primitive has a an initial velocity configuration. That means that if the robot satisfies this initial condition, then only I can apply this motion primitive, right? So for example, if a vehicle or say if a quadcopter is moving in this direction, right? And it's in motion, I cannot ask it to suddenly move in the opposite direction, right? So I, when it is moving in the forward direction, I cannot say that, okay, the next motion primitive will be something that will take the robo, robo in the backward direction. But I can say that when it is moving in this forward direction, it can move in the forward direction, continue moving in the forward direction, or it might move in, you know, right side or left side, right? So in this, if this, this is the precondition, then, you know, some of the motion primitives can be applied, some of the motion primitives cannot be applied, right? So the precondition is important. And then there is a notion of final velocity configuration. So once this motion primitive is applicable for tau amount of time, it is guaranteed that at the end of this tau time, the robot will be in some state. Right? And that will be, so now if we want to apply another motion primitive, this post condition will be 
have to satisfy the precondition for the motion motion primitive. Right? So that's how we, we will compose the motion primitives to synthesize this plan. Right? So I, I hope you are now seeing the connection between the plan and the underlying control problem. No, no. So, so the point is that this these motion primitives are designed offline, right? Again, you know, before solving the planning problem, we first synthesize this set of motion primitives. So, you buy you buy a robot, and you analyze it and figure out what possible mo motions it can take, and you design this set of motion primitives before even thinking about the planning problem, okay. right? And now this set goes as an input to the planning planner. It might fail, as I have said that this is the, the technique that I'm going to talk about, it's not complete, right? And you might realize that and later you might want to enrich the motion primitives, that's a different thing, right? For, but for a given set of motion primitives, my planner might not be able to find the plan that might be possible in the continuous domain. That's, that's the idea, right? Okay, so this uh, we understand, it's the initial velocity configuration, final velocity configuration, then we have this XRF, that's the relative position, right? So it says that if the robot is here, and if I apply this motion primitive here, then XRF is say for zero, that means after the execution of this motion primitive, the robot will be here. But these motion primitives are generally position oblivious. I could also apply this motion primitive here if the robot satisfied this precondition, and in that case, the robot could come here. Right? So this is relative to the initial location, not an absolute, absolute thing. And then we have this W. This is a set of intermediate location through which the robot might pass from its initial location to goal location to execute this motion primitive. Right? For example, here you see that if this mo motion primitive is applied here, this might pass through these intermediate locations. Right? Similarly, if it is applied here, this might pass through this intermediate location. So this set is given in the form of some relative location. So for example, let's make sure that we understand it. So for that motion primitive, what is the set of W? So first of all, what is XRF? XRF is <coughs> 4, 0. Right, so it takes the robot, four, you know, four steps in the x direction, zero step in the y direction. What are the, what is the set of W? It, it will be say zero zero, because wh while executing this motion primitive, this will occupy this. It will be one zero up to four zero. Right, so if you want to apply this motion primitive when the robot is location 3, 1, right? So you know that all the locations related to this 3, 1, uh, for example, 3, 1, it, it will be like 3, 1, then 4, 1, then 5, 1, then 6, 1, they could be occupied. Right? And similarly, you know, like in case of this, I mean, this is basically a kind of primitive for a quadcopter. So if the robot starts here, it might move through, you know, any of the, it might move like this, it might move like this, and so on. It depends on the wind. So, but we want to make sure that under the assumption, under some assumption on the disturbances, the robot is guaranteed to be within these cells when this executes the motion primitive, right? But why is this W set important? Because you know, huh? yeah? no, no, the direction is being taken care of by this velocity configurations, but this intermediate states, uh, you know, like locations are important because this will help us to deal with 
obstacle avoidance and collision avoidance and so on, <coughs> right? Because I will be able to apply this motion PVD here if all the locations are obstacle free. Right? And so on. And similarly, you know, like if you want to apply one motion primitive to one robot and another motion primitive to another robot, you would like to ensure that there is no overlap between the region through which these two robots might pass in the same step. Right? Oh. Yes, in the second case, it will, you know, like occupy more space. Right, in one step, I have to keep more space to free, uh, to be free. More collision free path. Huh? More? Collision free path. No, no, in every case, I would like to find collision free path, right? But for some motion, you, as you can see, that for some maneuver, I have to, I might need more space, right? But for mo some maneuver, if I am moving, you know, mo moving in the forward direction, then I might need less space, but if I am overtaking another car, I have to make sure that well, I have space around me and things like that. Right? So that's what it's happening. And also each motion primitive has some cost, right? So when this primitive is getting executed, it's solving a control problem. Of course, it will it has to apply some control input, right? So how much energy is spent, you know, to execute that motion primitive that is captured in the notion of cost. So maybe for this motion PVD, the cost will be more. For the other motion PVD, the cost will be less. That's all. Yeah. OK, so now let's look at the motion planning problem. Right? And uh, I call it motion planning problem, but it's actually you know, a combination of task planning and motion planning problem, because we are capturing the specification in this linear temporal logic, which will be incorporating <laughs> the tasks, right? So what do we have uh, in this problem? So it's, it, we represent it in the tuple form, right? So this problem, it has a set of robots for which we know the initial locations, right? So say I have two robots, I know their initial location. And for each robot, I have a set of primitives, right? So this, for example, I have say mod R, so this, uh, that number of robots. And for each robot, I have a set of motion primitives. And here I would like to answer this question about this heterogeneous robots, right? See, I am considering different set of motion primitive for different robots, right? So this framework allows you to have different sets of motion primitives for different robots, right? And that's how I can you know, like deal with heterogeneous multi-robot system. But as of now, one constant we have is that in the solver, we are assuming that, you know, each motion primitive takes tau amount of time, right? So in, so that might put some constraint, right? So if one robot can move fast and another robot can move slower, then, but still we will define their motion primitive based on this duration tau, right? Because we have a notion of step. The step, duration of the step is the same for all the robots. But maybe for some robot, the step size, you know, like it can move one, only one step forward in one time unit. For some other robot, it might be able to move four steps forward in one time unit. So what type of solver do you use? I, I, I come to that. That's probably the next slide. Yeah, I'll come to that. So, uh, yeah, so I come, n n n not number of <laughs> defined paths, number of steps on the path. Yeah, for it will vary, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. So, this okay, workspace is basically the workspace dimension, position of the obstacles, you know, so then you have this specification given in this linear temporal logic, that's the specification. And now, you know, like what we are going to do, we will create a set of constraints that will capture this problem and the solution of those constraints will give me a trajectory, right? 
So to create this set of constants, I have a notion of number of steps, right? So if I don't know the number of steps, I don't know how many motion primitives I have to solve for. Basically what, so for single robot, I will have a trajectory like this, right? I even don't know how many steps it might take, right? But what I will do, I will try with some values that are L equal to 4 and I will try to find the motion primitives that have to be applied here. If I can find a solution, then of course, you know, I am happy. If I do not find a solution, I try for a larger L, right? That is how, if you can guess it correctly, of in most cases we will not be able to guess it correctly, but well, we can always iteratively solve it. Okay. So, now you know we have this representation of this workspace. Let us look at this pictorial view. And the black regions are obstacles, and we assume that the size of the robot is such that it fits into a grid cell, right? So we, we, we are defining this trajectory formally now. Say that this phi i, that is the state of robot r i, right? It has two components. One is this velocity configuration, another is this its location. As I have mentioned that these velocity configurations are, you know, the p condition and post conditions are defined based on the velocity configurations generally, right? As I have given this example, that the conditions will be mostly on the direction of the vehicles, but it could be more general. Right? So to keep sim things simple, we represent the state as you know tuple that takes the velocity and the position, right? And then we define the state of multi robot system. It's a vector. So I have to now capture the state of all the all the robotic system, right? So I represent it as a vector like phi one to phi r, right? So this is the state of robot one, then robot two, and then finally robot mod r, right? Okay. And now this trajectory, so I have to define a trajectory, right? I, I like to synthesize this trajectory. It's a sequence of states, phi zero, phi one up to phi L, right? So because I have decided the length to be L, right? And these are the states. So I will have basically L transitions, right? We have L plus one states, right? What is phi zero? Phi zero again is a state of the multi-robot system, right? So it contains, it is like this, right? It has the component for all the states. So I have two robots, so two state component, then they move the next state, next state, and so on. So that is how the state of the multi-robot system evolves. Okay, of course, we had some, so phi zero, it has to satisfy the initial condition for the robot. There will be some such state. And then the trajectory, this, who knows? So this is how the trajectory will look like. Robots start from phi zero. Then we apply this primitive. This is again a vector, okay? So I, so you have two robots, so this prim1 is a vector, it is primitive for robot 1, primitive for robot 2, right? Primitive of robot 1 comes from the set of motion primitives for ro robot 1, primitive of prim2 comes from the, I mean, it is a vector. So, yeah, so basically this trajectory is a sequence of state and motion primitive. State is a vector containing the states of the, all the robots. Primitive is also a vector you know, capturing the primitives to be applied to the individual robot in that state and so on, right? So what you have to do is that <coughs> we'll, we'll generate a set of constraints where these primitives will be the decision variables. That means in the constant, we would like to solve the constants to find the values for these primitives that will ensure that this trajectory will satisfy the specification as a whole. Yes, please. Uh, it could be also three dimensional, yeah. I mean, here I am showing it in a two dimensional form, but yeah, it, in general it could be three dimensional also. So your motion primitives will be defined in the three dimensional space, yeah. Uh -huh. I, this is a vector, right? So this contains the primitive for 
all the robots right they will work in parallel right so all the primitives here they will be acting on the state all the robot in parallel right and they will move to pi 1 and then again the primitives of all the robots will be applied in parallel they will be executed in parallel and so on yeah okay okay now the question about the solver right here yeah. now this so as i have mentioned that we will translate this problem into a constraint solving problem and uh, so many of you might be knowing about this linear programming programming solver right so there how does the you know problem looks like you have a linear objective right and you have a set of constraints right but the crux is that <coughs> you know a solution has to solve all the constraints that means it's actually i am constant and or conjunction of all the constraints right but you know the specification that i am considering here it's more interesting because we are also allowing the choices right so i have i am allowing that okay satisfy this or satisfy that right there are this you know solvers for you know uh, linear programming solvers cannot be used directly right we can use that uh, i mean depending on the choice we can break this problem into many different problems but often that you know uh, that approach becomes intractable right but now there are solvers that you know uh, that uh, researchers had developed in the last you know couple of decades that can deal with constraints that involves both you know and and or conjunction and disjunction right and we will use those that solver and we'll see how it one trouble is that these solvers can solve the satisfiability problem that means given a set of constraints it can find a solution that satisfies all the constraints it natively cannot solve the optimization problem right but as we are as you can understand that okay we are synthesizing a plan right so we would like to synthesize the optimal plan right that will be a trouble here i mean but uh, we'll see how we can solve that right so please hold on to that okay and you know like uh, there are a few solvers available like one is this j3 it's from microsoft research it's quite powerful and there are other tools available you know that have been developed in some universities uh generally we prefer using j3 because this is more robust than other tools okay okay i think so your next session has got cancelled right so we have more time i guess till thirty only okay i see okay okay so now let's have a look at the solver right so this is one slide tutorial for this smp solver um so a canonical problem in computer science is called the satisfiability problem or boolean satisfiability problem the idea is that if you have some boolean formula right so i say that these are boolean variables b1 it could be either true or false i have to find an assignment to the boolean variables so that this overall formula becomes true right so for example if i have this simple boolean formula b1 and b2 i know that if b1 any one of them is one true then b1 or b2 will be true right so this formula says that either b1 is true or b2 is true or both are true so if one of them is true then the whole formula becomes true right but if i have b1 and b2 that formula will become true if both the variables become true right similarly i can think of very complicated formula right and the problem is to find an assignment to the variables so that the overall formula becomes true this is the you know like canonical satisfiability problem and 
this is considered as so called hard problem in computer science right. Uh, so, and it has been shown that many hard problems can be reduced to this satisfiability problem right because it is a search problem right. So, you are searching for a solution right and many problems are basically search problem in, com in computer science right. You search for a solution. So, what you can do is that you can translate your problem to this satisfiability problem and researchers have invested quite a lot of effort in developing solver for <coughs> solving such Boolean satisfiability problem right. And uh, these tools have been successful in solving problems in many domain including and most importantly they have been used in verification tools right in the hardware industries when they design you know processor chips they have to deal with boolean circuits right and they have to solve many verification problems at different level of development so they use those set solvers as the backbone of the verification tools that they develop right and so once we have this set solver so set solvers are dealing with only boolean variables right so now researchers have realized that okay we need similar tools to solve constraints that involve variables which are not Boolean right. So, for example, you look at this you know linear programming problem right. So, you have to deal with real variables you solve integer linear program you have to also you know take into account this integer variables right. So, now if we have variables coming from you know other uh, domains also then we there is a need to extend this set solvers to a more powerful solver and that is called this SMT solver. <coughs> its backbone again is a set solver, but it also can deal with constraints that <coughs> come from different theory. So, one th what we mean by theory the theory is kind of say linear arithmetic is a theory right. So, we know that uh, the constraints like this they are a specific kind of constraint they come from you know theory of linear arithmetic say if the variables are real right and so on. So, the point is that if somebody gives me some constraint that is the Boolean combination of constraint coming from some theory. So, for example, I have 3 x plus 4 y less than equal to 8 or 5 x plus 8 y less than equal to 11 right. So, this is a Boolean combination of constraint coming from the theory of linear arithmetic right. So, I can say that okay, b 1 I can introduce a variable b 1 that will represent this b 2 that will represent this right. So, basically it is b 1 or b 2, but you know the solution also has to respect the theory from where these constants are coming right. So, oh basically these SMT solvers are some extension of this set solver that can deal with constraints that basically you have to solve to solve the planning problem right. And uh, here I have shown a simpler example let us study that. Uh, so, say the problem is that you have one robot and it has two motion primitives right. Let us keep the thing simple one motion primitive takes the robot two steps in the x direction one step in the y direction and the other robot other motion primitive takes the robot in one step in the x direction one step forward in the x direction and two step forward in the y direction right. So, one is like this this another is like this this right. So, the problem is that starting from 0 0 location say so starting from 0 0 location can it reach a location where x is greater than 4 and y is greater than 3 in two steps. This is the question I mean I am giving an example of a very basic motion primitive uh, uh, very basic planning problem.
So, it has to reach somewhere here within two steps, right. So, we also assume that this 2 1 location it is an obstacle. Okay. So, now I have these two motion primitives. I have started with from 0 0. So, this robot starts from 0 0 and yeah. So, I have to reach that state you know beyond 4 3 within two steps right. So, in this step I know that I you know the robot can apply either this motion primitive or that motion primitive right. So, I represent the state of the robot in step 0 at x 0 and y 0 right which is given x 0 equal to 0 y 0 equal to 0. For now you ignore this part okay, and then you say that in the next step the robot can either use this primitive or this primitive right. So, if the robot uses this primitive then I can say that x 1 has to be what? x 0 plus 2 y 1 has to be y 0 plus 1 or if the robot uses other motion primitive then. So, the I this or if it is uses other motion primitive the x 1 equal to x 0 plus 1 and y 1 equal to y 0 plus Right. So, that is how I get a relationship between x 1 y 1 and x 0 y 0, but I have options as you can see that these options are being driven by the number of motion primitives. So, if I have many motion primitives like that I will have all the options in each step right. Similarly, x 2. So, x 2 and x 1 will be also related in the similar way. So, from x 2 I can from x 1 I can get x 2 by applying those same motion primitive either this or that. Then again ignore this part I would like to say that x 2 has to be greater than 4 y 2 has to be greater than 3 right. So, if there is no obstacle in the work space then I <coughs> generate this constant I give it to the solver and solver gives me a solution of x 0 y 0 x 1 y 1 x 2 y 2 if all the constants are satisfied right. If the constants are not satisfied it says that the constants are unsatisfiable ok. Uh, and also so I am talking about a theory of linear arithmetic there are other theories. So, there is a theory called theory of uninterpreted function it says that I have a function symbol and with some input right I can define this function symbol I can define how many inputs it has, but I do not know exactly what that function does, but this theory says that if this function gets equal input it will produce equal output right. So, I have say x 1 x 2 and I have say x 3 x 4 right. So, if x 1 equal to 1 x 2 equal to 2 x 3 equal to 1 x 4 equal to 2 then f x 1 x 2 will be f x 3 x 4 right. But if this is x 4 is equal to 3 say then x 4 will not match with x 2 then say that ok they are not equal right. So, this theory could be very useful in capturing the obstacles. So, if I have an obstacle in this region I can define a function saying that ok I have a function which takes x and y as input and I say that this value of this function at 2 1 is true if the location 2 1 is occupied by an obstacle right. And that can be also useful to ensure that this trajectory that we are generating is not passing through some obstacle by incorporating this constant. So, x 1 y 1 remember that x y 1 y 1 is the intermediate step. So, I want to say that this function of value of x 1 y 1 has to be false that means that this x 1 y 1 should not be occupied by an obstacle 
right. So that means I am capturing this obstacle avoidance here also in this set of constraints. Right. So you now give this to a solver. If it gets a solution, that means there is a way to reach the goal location from the initial location with the guarantee on the obstacle avoidance. That is the more or less the basic principle. So if there is a solution, the solver gives you a solution that is called model. And if it is, if there does not exist a solution, it gives you, it says that the set of constraints is unsatisfiable, but it can also give you something called unsatisfiable core. So say if you have 1000 constraints, you know, added by end and maybe this whole set of constraints are <coughs> unsatisfiable due to a small set of subset of constraints, right. It could be true, right. You might want to say that as we have seen that you have said that pi 2 and pi 3 in your constraints somehow you have this kind of thing. So that might make this whole set of constraints unsatisfiable though the you know like the problem is within a very small subset, right. So this solver will also give you a small subset of the set of constraint that itself is unsatisfiable. Say you have say 1000 constraints, if the solver gives you a set of 10 constraints that itself is unsatisfiable, by analyzing those 10 constraints you can realize that okay what the real problem is due to which this set of constraints is not getting satisfied, right. That is useful for debugging maybe in many cases it might happen due to some error in the specification itself, right. Okay, so, okay, I think person that is not here, so I will continue. Um, hmm? Oh, true and uh, satisfiable and unsatisfiable. What other solution could you expect? For example, uh, okay. No, no, no. So it's we are trying to synthesize a trajectory, right. So, we have to figure out that which motion primitive we apply in each step. There is, so, this is there is no binary search as such. I mean, we are searching for the solution assignment to the variable. Right? So, either there will be a solution or there does not exist a solution. Right? So, if you want to move to a point which is 100 steps, like I from this, you will not get a solution. Okay, so yeah. So now look at the architecture of this tool, right? So as we have mentioned that we, as input, we had this, you know, like system information, which is basically the information about the robot, and this will be the workspace information and the motion primitives for the robot, right? And then. Uh, the specification, these two are, they go to this constant generator. Uh, and then this constant generator generates this constants that is given to the solver. Solver either can solve it, it is satisfiable or it cannot solve it. So, if it is can solve it, it generates model which is basically the plan. If it cannot generate the model then, you know, it is just says that okay, this is the unset code, this is the subset of the constraint which itself is not satisfiable, deal with that and you would like to change the specification. Either you will increase the length or you will might figure out that okay, there are some bugs in this specification. So, this SMT solver, it is a third party tool, right. So, the whole algorithmic you know component that we have is basically the constraint generator, right. How do we generate constraints? that will capture the exact planning problem in the form of this constant that can be solved using the SMT solver, right. Uh, okay. So, for that, yeah. So, as I mentioned that, okay, we have the software to solve this planning problem. This is the software called uh, 
Compliance stands for compositional motion planner and this software solves this planning problem by invoking this SMT solver J3. Right? Uh, of course, you know like see we want to synthesize a trajectory like this where this primitives are the decision variable whose values we would like to decide right. and so what this tool does is that given this problem it generates the constants and constants have a few components one is that okay the initial constant it has to satisfy the robot start from their initial configuration then the transition constant right so transition constant means that okay as as so we, we are trying to find which motion primitive has to apply has to be applied in each step. So, we have to make sure that the precondition, post condition you know they are satisfied in each step for the motion primitive that the solver chooses right. So, we have to apply those constraints so that the solver comes up with the correct sequence of the motion primitive right. So, you have to ask the solver make sure that when you are composing <laughs> user you are using motion primitive 1 here motion primitive 2 here the motion primitive 2 should satisfy the post condition of motion primitive 1 the, the pre condition of motion primitive 2 should satisfy the post condition of motion primitive 1. So, these are the constraints that we have to give. So, they come under this transition constraint here also you know we can have constraints for obstacle avoidance, collision avoidance so on. Right. Then the third component is the specification and this is where we generate constraints that capture the essence of the linear temporal logic specification right. So, that is what will and the cost is that ok if we want to impose some cost constraint that ok we want to generate this trajectory within this cost <coughs> that we can add there. So, you want to cost constant will be just basically you can say that each primitive has some cost. So, you can introduce a variable that will cap you know that will hold the sum of the cost of all the primitives and you can say that that variable will take a value less than some given bound. Yes, so this is what I have mentioned that you know this transition constants have to take care of the precondition, post condition constants for obstacle avoidance, collision avoidance and so on. Uh, but for as I have mentioned that for multi robot system generally this collision avoidance constant is avoided to deal with scalability ok. So, now the most interesting part is the constants that we need to generate from the specification ok. So, we can talk about that um, because that is so say we have an L length trajectory right and I have this state phi 0, phi 1 and so on right. Remember that I, I have defined the propositions based on these states only right. So, this phi 0 might say that at the initial you know time the robot is in some locations right and let us just consider this formula like eventually say pi 3 right you would like to synthesize a trajectory that will satisfy this eventually pi 3 right and L is the length right. So, what constraints do you need to impose on the state of the trajectory? can you think about that. So, I would like to make sure that some state on this trajectory will satisfy pi 3 right that is what it means by you know satisfy. So, what we can say is that ok either pi 0 it will satisfy pi 3 this I am again introducing another symbol, but this means that this pi. So, if pi 0 is again you know like location and velocity 
as you can see that this is the state of the robot and it has this velocity and location. Location has this component that the atomic propositions are defined based on the locations only, right. So here it might be just 0, 0, pi 3 might be true at 5, 0, right. But when we give it to the solver, solver does not know anything, right. So solver will try to figure out whether <coughs> pi 0 satisfies pi 3, right, okay. Is the location in the state pi 0, is it 5, 0? It might or might not be or pi 1, sorry, this has to satisfy pi 3, right. And you can continue doing that or finally pi phi L has to satisfy, this is the satisfaction you know, notation pi 3, right. So if you impose this constant, so you are saying that either you know the pi 3 will be true in the first step or it will be true in the second step or it will be true in the third step and if the solver can gives you a solution then then you know that okay this pi 3 will be eventually you know satisfied by a trajectory of lentil right. So I mean I think I got a question whether I can ensure that the satisfaction within some step right and that you can so if you know, want to you know make sure that this eventually pi 3 satisfied within 5 step you do not allow this L to go beyond 5 right you get a solution then you know it can be you know satisfied within 5 step otherwise not. Right. So if you want to ensure eventually pi 3 I had eventually pi 3 now you want to ensure always pi 3 what do you want to do what constant do you generate then. For eventually I had this, either this or this or this and so on. So if I want to generate a trajectory of length L, or I want to make sure that it will always satisfy always pi 3, then what constant do I need to generate? It is just that all the states and yes basically and right. So you have to just Right. You can systematically do that right for all this linear temporal logic. Uh, similarly, you can say that okay, I have to do this not pi 3 until pi 4, right. So that also you can do. So if you want to make sure that this trajectory will satisfy this, so you want to synthesize the trajectory of length less than or equal to L, which will satisfy not pi 3 until pi 4, right. I, I have written here something but let us try to understand it. So this formula will be true if pi 4 becomes true somewhere and in all the states before that not pi 3 is true, right. So what are the options? Your options will be that you know either pi 0, uh, sorry pi 0 will satisfy pi 4, then you know that pi 4 has been reached in the first step, so I do not need to care about not pi 3 or and so I am saying this still is not. So here I am saying that the pi 4 could be satisfied the first step itself. If it does not satisfy Another option is that the pi 4 becomes satisfied in the second step. Right? This step specification has to be satisfied by the trajectory of length A. Right? And I have to generate a set of constants that will capture this. Right? So that will short. So this first step, <coughs> first option is that either this step satisfies pi 4. Right? Then I do not need to take care of not pi 2. Or that is satisfied here. Third option is that pi 4 circuit satisfied here. You have to make sure that not pi 3 is satisfied in all these two previous things. And so on. Right? So I have to generate those constants. So it's see you I have both conjunction in this step and then I have all the options. Another possibility is there, okay? Will there be any other possibility by not assigning? 